Welcome everyone to the Science of Wellbeing for Parents. I'm going to start with a quick introduction to why I'm teaching the course, and then we'll get to some of the content as we go through. I'm a faculty member at Yale University. I've been teaching there for over two decades. But in my last couple years on campus, I became what's called the head of college, where I started living with students on campus and really, really seeing their life up close and personal. And honestly, I was a little bit worried about what I was seeing. I was experiencing so many students who were feeling depressed, feeling anxious, and so on. And at first I worried that this was something about an elite school like, yeah, like what's going on at a, you know, this Ivy League school where students are so stressed out. But then as I dug into the literature, I realized that this isn't just an issue at Yale. This is the kind of thing that we're seeing nationally. And I did a little sort of deeper dive on this, and I'll kind of walk through some of the statistics just so you can see the kinds of things that I was seeing on campus. And so right now, nationally, in terms of our terrifying statistics, we find that over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function most days, so over a third. Over 50% of college students say they feel hopeless most of the time. Over 60% of college students report feeling overwhelming anxiety most days, which is the highest level they could report on the scale. Another over 60% of college students report feeling very lonely. This one was pretty shocking to me because I remember college is a time when you're eating with people in the dining hall and connecting with them really closely in real life yet more than two thirds of students report being very lonely most of the time. And then this manifests in the fact that students are pretty stressed out a lot of the time. So over 80% of college students report being overwhelmed by all the things that they have to do. So academic stress is one of the highest we've seen kind of historically since we've been measuring this. And this winds up turning into some pretty nasty mental health statistics, like the fact that right now nationally, more than one in 10 college students has seriously considered suicide in the last year. And these are also data from 2019, which is the last available version of the survey where they had these stats. So we might even be thinking that things post-COVID maybe have gotten worse. So this is really bad. And this was one of the reasons that I decided to develop this new class on the science of happiness. I really wanted to share the strategies that my field has that students could use to feel better with the students in my community. And so we christened it Psychology in the Good Life. So it sounded kind of fun. It would sort of pop from the course catalog. At the time, I thought, you know, 30 or so students would take this. So you could imagine my surprise when I walked into a classroom that looked a lot like this. Um, it was a lot more than 30 students. Over a quarter of the entire Yale student body showed up to take the class, over so around 1,200 students, which I thought was cool. It shows that our students are voting with their feet. They don't like this culture of feeling stressed and anxious, and they really wanted to do something about it. From there, we got the sense that this was something that people really wanted. And so what we did was to put online the first iteration of our class on Coursera.org. We christened it the Science of Wellbeing. And especially during COVID, it got very popular. We had over 4 million learners sign up for the class, which we found to be quite incredible. And what was really cool about it was that we were able to do some testing to figure out that this class really worked. We weren't just sharing these strategies. Students were really using them and putting them into effect. And just so you can kind of nerdily see how this works, the way we tested this was we compared students' self-reported mental health pre and post taking my class to a control class, which is another class that Yale puts online, just our intro to psych class, similar in length and so on. But this one wasn't really teaching strategies to protect your happiness, and mine was. We're going to nerd out a few times. I know it's like late in the evening, but I'm going to show a couple graphs just to prove my point. Kind of plotting the well-being that students experience, the flat lines, the consistent lines are my science of well-being class versus the hash lines, which are the intro to psych. And here's the data we found, and you can see two things. One is, first, taking any Yale class seems to improve your well-being, which is pretty cool. You gotta, you gotta learn something, which is fun. But the cool thing is that students from before the class to after in the happiness class are going up. And this is about a point on a 10-point happiness scale. But immediately once the class was online, we heard something else which is that that's great that you're sharing this content for college students, but what about younger learners? What about teenagers who are experiencing a lot of the same mental health issues that you were just talking about for college students? We know this from lots of different indicators. I think the scariest one most recently is the fact that the recent World Happiness Report, which has been measuring happiness in all kinds of generations for decades now, has basically found that young people in the United States in particular are the most unhappy that they've ever been since the survey has been running. And so we said, okay, we do need to kind of get content out there to help teenagers. We sort of revamped our class, refilmed it in front of high school audiences, and put together a new version of the class, The Science of Wellbeing for our Teens, which has also been quite popular. We've had over 100,000 learners since the class launched at the beginning of the year, which is great. But one of the interesting things that we saw when we put this class out there was that, yes, we're kind of reaching lots of teens on Coursera.org. Teens are coming to the class and learning a lot about strategies they can use in high school and middle school to feel better. But a lot of the teens that are showing up seem to be doing it not by themselves. They seem to be taking it with their parents. And interestingly, slightly less than a quarter of the views we're getting 
don't involve the teen at all, it's just the parents <laughs> who are watching by themselves. And what that convinced us is that maybe we should be looking not just at kind of regular adult well-being or teenage well-being, maybe we should think really carefully about parent well-being. And we're not alone in our thinking about this. Recently, in fact, the Surgeon General has put out his whole report about the public health crisis that is parental stress. Remember, this is a, a person in the government who puts out reports of like, there's an opiate crisis or there's an obesity crisis, and he is saying that there's a public public health crisis that parents are just experiencing too much stress. And the advisory is really rich. I kind of encourage parents who want to learn more about this to read it directly. But here's just a quick quote from him. He notes, the stress and mental health challenges faced by parents, they're not always visible, but they can take this really steep toll. And it's important to recognize that this isn't just like a few individual parents who are suffering. This is a really serious public health concern for our country. The report also goes on to list some pretty terrifying statistics about parents' mental health, like the fact that right now, nationally, over 40% of parents say that they're too stressed to function most days. This is almost double what you hear adults reporting who are non-parents. Over 60% of parents report feeling lonely too. So it's not just our young people who are feeling lonely. Parents are also kind of feeling squeezed out of social connection, which is interesting. And almost a quarter of parents self-report having some diagnosed mental illness. And this is much higher than in the non-parent population. Right now, nationally, over 70% of parents say Parenting is a lot harder than it was 20 years ago. And I think that's for lots and lots of reasons. The report identified a couple. One is the fact that parents have to worry about student safety in a very different way than they ever had to before. Over 70% of parents are reporting that they worry their child might be hurt in a school shooting, both their physical safety, but also their mental safety. An almost equivalent number of parents are saying that they're worried about their child's mental health, right? And that they, their child might die by suicide and things like that. And so these kinds of drastic statistics are really new. They're also not the only thing that's really new because one of the things we've known about parenting for a long time is that parenting can be tough. Parenting obviously is a, a wonderful activity that gives you a lot of joy and a lot of moments of like true, true happiness. But I think, like the Surgeon General, it's important to recognize that it's stressful and it comes with a lot of challenges. This leads to what researchers have called the parenthood paradox, which is defined as people who become parents wind up experiencing a decrease in their overall mental health. And that stays with you till your child gets out of the house. And then the good news is your well-being goes back to normal. <laughs> but this, this isn't great, right? This is not what we were supposed to get. I think this parenthood paradox has been summed up really nicely by the journalist Jennifer Senior, who has this book um, where she claims that parenting is all joy and no fun. Um, and I think the laughter in the room suggests that maybe, maybe she is right. Parents in this current generation have to worry about things that no other parent had to worry about before, right? Like how much technology to give your kids and how to navigate this, right? They're just kind of new stressors as we've discussed. Here's the Surgeon General on this. Beyond the traditional challenges of parenting, protecting kids from harm, worrying about finances, managing teenagers who are searching for their independence, there are these new stressors that other generations didn't have to contend with. Managing social media, concerns about mental health, the epidemic of loneliness, you know, all these things are disproportionately affecting kids today, and that means parents have to worry about them. And that's the reason for this course, which is that I want to figure out a way to help. I want to figure out a way so that parents can protect their own mental health. And I think that's really important because it turns out that parent mental health matters much more than we think. In part, it matters because it really affects your children's mental health. In fact, one of the biggest predictors of, say, depression and anxiety in children is whether or not their parents are experiencing depression and anxiety. And we know this because of the psychological phenomenon of emotional contagion. What is this? It is the fact that we have a tendency to catch the emotions of the people around us, almost like we would catch a cold or catch a virus. Emotional contagion doesn't work equally. People in sort of leadership positions wind up much more susceptible to giving their emotions to others than just kind of general folks. Um, this means that if you're a leader at work, your emotions are particularly relevant for your company right, because all the folks who work under you could catch them. But unfortunately, within a family, this means that parents are in this dangerous position of kind of having their emotions get caught by their kids. And this is particularly a problem because it doesn't just transmit one way. Of course, if your emotions are getting caught by your kids and they're not feeling so hot, then you get them back. And then this can become this sort of terrible, vicious cycle. And what we want to do is to fix this. And that's why you're all here today. Our goal is to develop a new version of these classes that we've been teaching at Yale, but one that's specifically designed for parents. And throughout the class, what we wanted parents to learn were about strategies that they could use to help their own mental health, deal with their own stress and their own sense of overwhelm, and learn strategies that they could teach their kids to navigate the tough times that they're dealing with too. What we decided to do is to just ask parents directly, kind of like I'm doing here, 
what are the kinds of things you need help with? Um, and we put a large survey in our Coursera class, and our Coursera learners, many of whom are parents, were kind enough to tell us the sort of biggest well-being problems that parents are facing right now. And those are the different topic domains we're going to cover. One of the challenges that parents talked about was time management, kind of dealing with the fact that they're feeling very time famished and overwhelmed. Here's just one quote from one of our parents. I often find myself with no time for myself. You're balancing work, parenting, and other responsibilities. This leaves me feeling overwhelmed and stretched too thin. I'm seeing a lot of nodding in the audience. So time management, a big one. In addition, we also heard that parents really want to learn more about what they can do to prioritize their self-care. They know they need to do it, but they don't know how to squeeze it in or what to be doing well. Again, just so you can see what parents are saying here, I know the importance of self-care and my mental health, but it's hard to find time for activities like exercise and meditation. Sometimes parents don't know what those things are, but sometimes they know and it's just really hard to squeeze them in. So what are strategies parents can use to do that, set boundaries and so on? Another challenge we want to help parents navigate is sort of figuring out what to do with negative emotions. Childcare has so many wonderful opportunities and positive emotions, but it's the negative ones that tend to stick around. I struggle with creating the me time without feeling guilty. I think if there was one word that popped out of our survey the most, it was like guilt, guilt, guilt. I feel bad even writing this. There's a constant feeling of stress from not being able to balance everything, right? So how do we navigate emotions like guilt and shame and anger and these things that come up? That's one of the things we are, we'll be talking about in this course. We also heard from parents a lot that they want some help with stress management. Even as the Surgeon General reports, parents are really stressed, but they reflected that back in their surveys. I feel like I'm always serving others, my job, my child, my spouse, without having anything left for myself. The stress of trying to manage my child's behavior and discipline effectively without support adds to this burden. I'm seeing a lot of nods in the, in the group here. Stuff manage it, big one we're gonna tackle. We also heard from parents that they're very worried about their kids academically, that it feels like a new pressure that parents are facing right now is the fact that our kids need to succeed, we need to prepare them for the next steps, but it's not clear how to do that or how to do that in a way that doesn't stress our kids out and make us kind of feel like taskmasters. The pressure to do it all for our kids, to set them up for success can feel overwhelming. It's it's easy to feel like we're letting them down when we can't kind of give them everything. So what are some best practices for giving our kids academic enrichment without overloading them, without making them feel famished for time and overwhelm themselves? We'll kind of talk through some of those strategies. In addition, heard lots of worries about technology and social media. Again, this new landscape that parents today are facing in a way that no other parents have faced. What are some best practices for this? Parents really want help here. I worry so much about the impact of digital exposure on my kids' development. What can I do to kind of make this better? Right, and protect them and make sure they're safe. And so these are all the things that we're gonna be focusing on. And we're gonna do that with a particular framework as we go through all of these different puzzles. It's a framework that I've taken from cognitive behavior therapy or CBT if you know it, which is just a set of therapeutic practices that are based on trying to work through and change three things. To change how we think, like all our thoughts and belief, to change what we feel, what our emotions are and how our bodily sensations work, and to change how we act. And this is often talked about in terms of the cognitive triad. You need to be working on all of them, changing how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So for each of these problems, we're going to dig in and try to figure out how we can change these things so that parents can feel better, but also give your kids strategies to change how they think and act and feel so that they can feel better too.